We have some work to do. We need to improve your sex life and we can do that. I know we can and you're not alone. And I know this because you've told me. I recently asked my Instagram followers if they had a magic wand, what would they need to change in order to make their sex life magical, fulfilling, and an important part of their relationships. Here's what you said. Increase my libido. Get my husband to pay attention to me. A less hectic schedule. Less on my mind. Fewer people and more privacy in our home. A partner whose sex drive matched mine. The confidence to tell my husband what actually feels good. The ability to have an orgasm. More energy. For my partner to take initiative. To feel more connected to my husband. For sex not to feel painful. For sex not to be so boring. For my husband to understand foreplay and caressing and getting me in the mood before we have sex. To get out of my own head and stop thinking about my body for both of us to lose weight to be able to relax and not feel so much shame to be happy with my body to actually enjoy sex to just be able to let go more creativity more spontaneity different positions not the same routine every time to fix my hormones and lastly so many of you said i don't know i don't know what the problem is but there's a problem and that's what we're going to talk about here today on the Shaleen show my name is Shaleen Johnson. Thank you so much for joining me. Today, we're talking about this because this is what we do on The Shaleen Show. We talk about things that make your life better. And ladies and gentlemen, your life gets better when all the most important areas of your health are addressed. And for whatever reason, we've kind of like pushed sex off into the corner. It's this thing that most of us grew up, if you're of a certain age, feeling like there's a major taboo, that it was something we weren't supposed to talk about, that it was something that we were embarrassed to speak about and and no one ever taught us what it was supposed to look like in a monogamous relationship like who are you to learn that from how do you understand how to make sex better if it's something that we have put so much shame around it in fact the reason why i'm doing this episode is because on my patreon which is it's a it's a paid for podcast it's a private podcast where i talk about private matters well, one of the things that I have really been studying in this season of my life, meaning being an empty nester, being someone who's been married for 28 years, I've really been studying like how to make our relationship more exciting, more fulfilling, more rewarding, because it's a new season for us. And every season that I'm in, I always read books. I read the books. I listen to the podcast. I hire the experts. When we first had kids, I read all the books on parenting. When we first got married, I read all the books on communicating and what it meant to be a, a good spouse and like how to have a strong marriage. And like no matter what stage we're in, whether it was raising teenagers or you name it, I'm, I'm always trying to figure out like how can I be better at this stage? Because you can't just, you know, wing it. I mean, you can, but I, I want to be the best possible person I can be at whatever stage that I'm in. And it's always a new stage. So it's like, I want to go to school for that stage and the stage that I'm in currently really re what I feel like I need to do is what I felt like I needed to do was to figure out like how do I make this stage really exciting, really fulfilling, really just like the best years of our lives. So what I started doing was reading books about intimacy, which led me to books about sexuality and about sexuality in monogamy. And I started talking about this on my Patreon and it made people so uncomfortable. Not everybody, but a lot of people. And so like last week, I don't know if you listened to my podcast last week, but last week I had the situation where one of the people in my Patreon group was like, um, this just makes my skin crawl. You're obsessed with sex. What? I've only had sex with one man since the day I met him. And that's been now over 33 years. So no, I'm not obsessed with sex. I'm obsessed with having the most connected, fulfilled relationship with one man. That's what I'm obsessed with. The thing that I realized in her, like having, she threw this like whatever, she, she made comments on in my Facebook group. What I realized is that conversation didn't just make her uncomfortable, it made a lot of you, a lot of women especially, uncomfortable. Because if you're, like I'm 54 years old and I think there's, you know, if you're a certain age, we just, we weren't supposed to talk about those things. Think about it. When you were growing up, like the absolute worst thing anyone could call you was either conceited or the S word. I don't know if I'm going to get canceled if I say this on YouTube, but if someone called you the, a right, then, I mean, that was the worst thing you could possibly be called when we were growing up. But today, 
if you don't understand your own sexuality and how to take it to the next level, then you're really limiting your own potential and the potential of your relationship. So today, what we're going to talk about are the things that need to be talked about in order for you to have a better sex life, to improve your libido, to understand what it takes to like learn these things. And we're just, I'm literally just going to scratch the surface today. That's my goal. My goal today is to get you on the right path. I can't fix everything. There's like, there's so many specifics and so many nuances and so many things that are very personal to you, whether it's trauma. I mean, there's a whole host of reasons why people might be having average or no sex at all. To the people who want to stand for their sexuality and want to have great sex, but hit a wall, either a, a physical wall, or maybe they've had trauma, maybe they had, you know, maybe it's painful, or they've had emotional trauma, or they've just gotten bored with each other, which was really all that was wrong with my marriage was that I got bored. It's easier for men. There's this really interesting thing about the sexes, you know. The masculine is testosterone dominant. And he's very steady state and very goal-oriented, right? He's like a heat-seeking moisture missile. <laughs> and he can essentially have pretty much the same sex every time and be pretty satisfied. Where we women being estrogen dominant, you know, we're kind of up in our heads. We're uh, thinking about a million things. We have a hard time settling into our bodies and we need a lot more variety. And we have a massive pleasure potential that often stays unmet in our relationship because the masculine thinks, oh, it's really great for me. It must be great for her, but it's not as great for her. Now, as somebody who is postmenopausal, which means I have gone more than a year without having a period, that's what menopause is. As someone who is postmenopausal, there are a lot of conversations, especially in this community, of from women who are saying, like, well, one of the reasons why sex isn't good for me now is because of vaginal dryness or hormones, right? So it could be PCOS, it could be because you've just had a baby, it could be because you're on birth control pills, like all of these things, hormones do in fact impact your ability to enjoy sex, to have an orgasm. They can affect your mental health and your mental health is a huge component when it comes to your sexual health. Like, let's face it, you can't relax and get out of your head and actually let go and be free and enjoy yourself and be present. If you're worrying about the bills, if you're worrying about work, if you've got stress and anxiety and kids and all these things, and then all of a sudden you're in bed and your partner wants to get it on, like the last thing you feel like doing is getting it on. So we assume oftentimes that it's our hormones, but is it always our hormones? When you think about libido, there's a couple of things. Okay. A lot of women think, okay, if my libido is down, it's my hormones. So first mm -hmm. of all, they think it's their problem, mm -hmm. not that they're just bored to death. The second thing is they think, okay, it's my libido, so it must be my hormones. My hormones are bad. But it's not really necessarily about hormones. Um, and we could talk about what, what, the, what I noticed are the two libido depressants that nobody ever considers. What I say to couples when they are struggling is do erotic play dates. Think about learning things together because it brings you, when you learn things together, it gets him out of his, I already know everything mind, which is testosterone, all that confidence, right? Mm -hmm. It makes him overly confident and it makes her overly worried. And so he has to know that she needs to be very created in a, loved in a very safe space, but he has to bring the fun in and the variety in because that's not his natural inclination. He's not worried about anything. He doesn't feel unsafe, so he doesn't understand how unsafe she feels. Letting go, exposing her vulnerabilities, worrying about her body image issues. You know, these are all the things that really are to estrogen's blame. And so once a guy understands, okay, I need to make this fun, how do I make this fun? Learn things together. A couple that plays together stays together, especially in the bedroom. Now listen, I'm not a sex expert and there may be a whole host of reasons why your sex life is suffering right now. It could be trauma. It could be hormones. It could be, however, that you and your partner just have never learned how to talk about these things, how to communicate these things, how to pleasure each other, how to even pleasure yourself or what it is you like. Okay, I know this might be too much information, 
probably is. So I apologize. This is the part where like maybe my kids want to dip out if they're watching this, but I want my kids to watch this episode. You know why? Because sex is healthy and sex is an important part of your marital relationship. And I want their sex lives to be so freaking good. And I hope if my kids are watching this or if your kids are watching this, that you help them to understand this is normal and it's something you're going to have to work at. None of us are born knowing how to do these things. None of us are born feeling comfortable talking about these things. It's an educational process that should never end. Think about it. What most of us learned about sex was either from an awkward conversation with one of our parents, like a singular conversation, if you were lucky, or you learned about it from watching porn, which is not really sex. Like literally it's, it's the dumbest thing ever has. I mean, if you and or your partner have learned what you think are like things that work and get your significant other excited from watching porn, you are, that's, that's a big part of the problem because it's just, it's not even close to reality. It's not even close, but I do want you to know, I want you to have some hope and I want you to know this. It is very possible to restore your libido and to turn things around for you and your partner and to have continually sex that just gets continually better and better and better. And I'm not the only one who thinks this. Esther Perel is like one of my absolute go-to favorite experts on the subject of desire and sexuality. She's also done a whole series. I think she became super well-known from her series she did about affairs. So if you haven't tuned in to Esther Perel, do so. She's got a, a podcast that's called Where Shall We Begin? And she's got a couple of TED Talks. I'll link to them in our show description. But here's what she wants you to know about some of the myths regarding aging and sex. Sexuality and the connection and the intimacy improves when their sense of self-worth improves, when they feel better about themselves, when they accept themselves more, then they, when they are less riddled with shame. It's all of that that goes into the experience. And because we live in a performance-driven, industrialized place, we really would like to be able to quantify sex. How many orgasms, how hard, how long, how many pills, and all of that, rather than understand that the erotic is a beautiful, radiant interlude that is massively unproductive. It has no numbers. You can't measure it. It's a state of being. So maybe you're asking yourself, how do I know if the sex that I'm having is good sex or is it average sex? Like, like, how do I know? Like, how do you compare it? Like, certainly you can't compare it to porn. If you're like me, like my girlfriends, we don't really talk about these. Like we do, but it's like so surface level. You know, so like, how do you know if there's more out there, if you've got greater potential, if you should be working on it and trying to improve it, or if you're like, this is as good as it's going to get, like, how would you know? Well, here's how renowned sex expert Tracy Cox breaks down the very personal nuances. A sexless relationship is one where sex hasn't happened in a year. And that's a low sex relationship to be 10 times a year. But it's all dependent on where you're at in life. Like if you, if you've just had babies and they're under two, you're not going to be having a lot of sex. If you're 18, you just got together, you're going to be having an awful lot of sex. You know, if you're part, if you've just gone through menopause or perimenopause and everything's gone to hell, you're not going to be having sex at that period of time. So you can't, there is no one size fits all thing. So find your normal is what I would say. And if your normal is no sex, so long as you have a conversation about it, that's fine. But you, what you cannot do is stop sex and not talk about it. As I've said, I am I'm not a sex expert, but I am a I'd like to consider myself a mindset expert having done thousands of podcasts on mindset. I can tell you this. If you're defining your marriage as sexless, like think about that. Like I I don't even know why sex experts use that term sexless. Because if you've ever had sex, you don't have a sexless marriage. And if you're thinking about your relationship as being sexless, then that's what you're putting the focus on. And as you know, like what, what we focus on becomes our reality. So if that's what you're thinking your reality is, then that becomes your reality. So maybe we change the definition. So maybe instead of labeling your marriage as sexless, you might label your marriage as going through a downturn. Like it's, it's just one of those normal phases, relationships whether we're talking about your physical health, your mental health, or your sexual health, they go through ups and downs. And that doesn't mean that we can't turn it around. But how do you fix that? 
Most experts agree it starts with a connection outside of the bedroom. And it's at this point in the podcast that I'm going to encourage you to send this to your significant other. I want them to listen to it as well. You want them to listen to this episode as well. And ideally, it would be great if you just rewound this from the beginning and together you watch this episode. If your sexual relationship is something that's important to you, which I know that it is, then this is how we can start communication. And I know this because this is how my husband and I started having this conversation. I started watching a couple of podcasts about improving your sexual health, how how to make monogamy hot. And I started listening to them with him in the car. And then I said, hey, you remember that episode that I was listening to about how to make monogamy hot? I saw that same expert doing another episode. I wanted to send you this. Or, and I started sending him like little clips. And basically I told him like, the only reason why I'm listening to all of any of these episodes is not because like there's a problem. I think there's a problem with our relationship. I just want to be better for you. I want things to be like super hot. Don't you? And he was like, yeah. Like, so that's a really big piece of this. I think so many of us don't know how to bring up the subject with our partner. They're going to feel like, I think there's a problem or we're going to make it about me. I just, I don't think that there's anyone out there who could say to their partner, I've got some ideas and I'm thinking about like how I could really spice things up between us. I can't imagine that there's anyone out there who has a partner who's like, yeah, I'm not interested. It's how all in how you frame it. Like make it about you trying to improve things for them because by improving things for them, you're going to improve things for both of you, right? Oh my gosh, you guys, there's so much I have learned in the last year that has lit our sex life on fire. Things I didn't freaking know, things I didn't know about my own body, things I didn't know about female sexuality and male sexuality. Like I swear to God, I was operating (laughs) with an eighth grader's level of sexual intelligence. And I think my husband was too. I mean, but I can't fault us. How would we know anything more? Do you know what I'm saying? But there's so much information out there. So I'm speaking to those of you, especially those of you who like, you grew up in a household where you just, you didn't talk about those kinds of things. It felt kind of like taboo. You're supposed to know how to do all of these things. And especially if you've been with the same person for a really long time, you just think like this, this is just how it is. It's not true. Like I have a completely different sex life. Oh, I'm just saying like, it's mind blowing. And I always thought I had a good sex life. I thought it was good because we were both having orgasms and we had sex on a regular basis. So I thought that was good. But you don't know you don't know how good things can get until you learn more about what's possible. <laughs> Anyways, by the way, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to The Shaleen Show. Have you checked out all the episodes that I've done? Like I've done episodes on perimenopause and menopause and strength training and how to improve your relationship with money. Like so many great episodes here on The Shaleen Show, here on YouTube. So make sure you're subscribed and don't forget to hit that notification bell so that you know when I release a new episode. But sex is so much more than intercourse. Please know that. And and this is especially true for ladies. So let me just give you a spoiler alert. Okay, fellas, if you're listening, and I pray ladies right now, rewind to this part so and, and, and mark it so you don't forget the minute mark where I say this. Fellas, it is so difficult for a woman to have an orgasm with vaginal penetration. It's just not the way that we're built. She needs clitoral stimulation. And not just like, okay, boom, we're having sex. Let's have some clitoral stimulation. Like we need to get warmed up basically all day. So that means flirting. That means caressing. That means sending sexy text messages. That means going slower. That means warming her up. That means warming up the body. That means the way the male and the female body works. And listen, I I know I've got a lot of listeners who are gay or homosexual and And I I don't want you to think that we're ignoring the things that you need to hear too. But today, just to really make sure that I I speak to the broadest audience, I'm I'm talking about men and women. And But please know that these things affect gay couples, they affect lesbian couples, and it's important for all of us. So seek the help that you need. But when we're talking about females, man, it's different for us. We need to be warmed up. 
Our parts work differently. We need lots of blood flow. And that doesn't necessarily mean specifically touch. It means like near the areas. Isn't that great? Like you don't have to just go like, like a heat seeking laser missile towards the punani. You know what I'm saying? Like tease us and caress us and say lovely things to us and send us flirty messages throughout the day. It should be like an all day process. Like sex is so much more than intercourse. In fact, another one of my favorite experts, he wrote the book, Love Worth Making. I highly, highly recommend it. Dr. Steven Snyder. He says, don't focus on the intercourse. What ultimately heals a relationship is usually not the sex. It's the time you spend in bed before you have sex, just being in the moment together doing nothing at all. Before we go too much further, I want to ask you a personal question. You'll see that it's pinned as the first comment here on YouTube. And if it's too personal, please, you don't have to answer it. But if you don't mind, I'd love to know how often is the right amount for you right now? And you know what I'm talking about? Like boom, chicka, bow, wow. Like how many times per week, per month, per year, feels like the right amount for you. So many women wrote to me this week and shared with me their stories of low libido, saying that they've been with the same partner. It's boring. The sex is painful. The sex isn't interesting. Well, sex is painful if you uh, aren't on the right hormones, right? So first I want to suggest that you work with a practitioner who understands how to test and also support your hormone replacement. Because if you're low on estrogen, if you're low on testosterone, of course, things are going to be dry. Of course, then therefore, sex is going to be painful, which means then you're going to be having sex less often. And then we know that the vagina, the vulva, all of these parts of the female anatomy, they start to deteriorate. They start to age. They start to atrophy, which then makes sex painful. And now you're combining like atrophy, painful sex, without proper lubrication, what, what would make you think, in what world would you be craving more of that? You wouldn't. That is something you can address. That is something you can improve. That is something you can replace and replenish. You can replenish those hormones that help you to rejuvenate your sexual health. And frankly, that's your responsibility. Now, I know you might not be too motivated to do that right now because you're like, Ugh. I mean, I get it. Like in your mind, you're like, why would I want to do that? It's painful. I, do, I don't desire it. Therefore, I don't need it. So why would I do that? Well, I'm here to tell you that it is part of your overall health. It makes you feel closer and more connected. It makes you feel more confident about your body, about the desire that your partner has for you when you are connected on a sexual basis. So take the time to figure out how you can improve your hormones, but it goes beyond that. And that's why I want to encourage you to let this episode be your jumping off point, okay? And again, I, I want to use myself as an example because like, I'm not the expert. I'm just somebody who's been on this path. And I like for you to think of me as your girlfriend who's telling you like, hey, I'm just a couple of steps ahead of you or you know, for some of you, you're a couple steps ahead of me, but for a lot of you, I, I just think it's like, if I can share with you what I've been through and by example, you can try some of those same things and it helps you in your life, mission accomplished, even if it just helps one woman. So I started listening to these podcasts and these books and I started like really trying to understand like, what is it? I know this sounds crazy, like as a 54 year old adult woman, like that I'm understanding like how his body works and how my body works. I know that sounds freaking crazy, but as I'm like reading these books and I'm going to link to some of them, including come as you are, including eroticism, including how to make love worth having and, and several others I'm going to list in our show notes. I started listening to these books as I started like really digging into the podcast and understanding more about my own anatomy, about human desires, about fantasy, about like the things that get a woman turned on. I was like, this makes so much freaking sense. And the more I was getting into it, the more I was talking to my husband about it. And I don't know about you, but I just can't imagine that you have a partner who you could say to them, like, I'm learning all these things and it's really exciting and I want to try this and I want to try that, that they're not also going to get excited. But the bottom line is this, like if I had to cut to the chase, it was understanding my own anatomy. 
and what it takes to get me in the mood that made the biggest difference of all. Now, listen, she is very over the top. I'm going to share with you one of my favorite experts. Her name is Susan Bratton. Now, she is like over the top. And some of the language that she uses, even for me, like even though I feel like I'm like really open-minded now about sexuality and I'm a sex positive person, even some of the things that she says, I'm like, oh, I can't believe she said that. Like it's, you know, it's a little bit shocking, but she literally has blown my mind. Like I've learned so much about my body and his body and, and just toys and excitement and just different hacks and tools, but also, and perhaps even more importantly about the importance of communication and the importance of like really getting comfortable with your body and getting comfortable with your partner and and learning about how all of those things make for a much more exciting sex life. So again, listen, ladies, I am not your expert, but even if you can listen to a few of the podcasts that I'm going to link below from Susan, I think that you're going to find that, you know, even if some of it makes you uncomfortable, the parts that you're willing to be open-minded to are going to have a positive impact on your sex life. I generally think that although people call it dirty talk, it's a bad name because first of all, it's not dirty. There's nothing wrong with it. I like to call it sensual talk or bedroom talk. Some people are very um, visual when they're sexual and they really like to see, you know, maybe he loves to see her in lingerie or she loves to see him flex his muscles or whatever it might be, or they like to look in each other's eyes. They like a lot of eye contact. Some people are more auditory. They like to hear things. So if you tell them a fantasy story while you're giving them a hand job or, you know, something like that, that can be a really fun thing. And then there are people who are what are called kinesthetic. So there's visuals, auditories, and kinesthetic style of people in the bedroom. And kinesthetic people really like the feeling of things. If they have their eyes open, it actually takes them out of their sensational experience. So they often keep their eyes closed. They tend to be people who are a little more eye shy. And what's neat about those kinesthetic people is that they're very, very responsive to the sensation that you're delivering. And so sometimes whispers are really nice for them where they can feel the breath of your breath in their ear. There could be things like that. And then one of the surefire things that everybody loves is a kind of dirty talk that is what I would call appreciative dirty talk, where what you're actually doing is you're describing what's turning you on in the moment. One of the most important things for you to keep in mind, especially for the male partners, is this. We women need a lot more time to get in the mood. A guy can like, crawl into the sheets and, you know, five minutes earlier, you could have been on a Zoom call. And as soon as his body comes in contact with your body, he's like ready to go. Ladies, we work a little differently. So fellas, if you're listening, if you really want it to be outrageously exciting and for her to be in the mood, you've got to kind of make that happen throughout the day, or at least a lot earlier than like five minutes before the act. She doesn't want an offer for sex. She wants small, incremental offers that lead her toward her pleasure. Okay. Yeah, so not a big bite, little tiny snacks, little tiny, little baby bites all the way into the bedroom, you know, following the little Hansel and Gretel trail. (laughs) Dr. Snyder calls this simmering. Most couples, get into this rut. The only time they get excited together is when they're gonna have sex. But the happiest couples make a point to get excited together even when they're not gonna have sex. In sex therapy, we call this simmering, getting aroused just for a minute or two, for no reason at all, just because it feels good. You know who's the best at simmering? Teenagers. You take a couple, boyfriend and girlfriend, in high school. Let's say they have three minutes between classes. They meet at one of their lockers, hold each other, inhale each other's scent, breathe together, feel excited, and then the bell rings, and they're off to the next class, feeling just a little buzzed. There's no reason when you're married that you can't do the exact same thing in the kitchen before dinner, in bed at night before you fall asleep, or on your way out the door in the morning. All you need is to get over the idea that arousal 
always has to lead to sex. Again, I mean, there's so many things that we could discuss in this episode. The number one complaint that I heard from most of you is just low libido. You're, you're, you just don't desire it. But again, like, why would you desire it if it's been average? Why would you desire it if it's been painful? Why would you desire it if you don't find yourself desirable? And that's a big piece of this. Listen, your body is beautiful and your partner doesn't care the way you think that they do about your the flaws and the imperfections that you see in the mirror. They're not thinking about those things. You are. So you got to get out of your own head. If you have sex more often and your partner enjoys it, your brain goes on a subconscious level, well, you know what? I can't be that bad because he's having sex with me or she's having sex with me, whoever's having sex with you, they're enjoying it. And so you, it start, your brain starts to make sense of it all and go, okay, right, you know, this is, I'm obviously not as undesirable as I think. And it starts to sort of become better and more able to be dealt with. So the more you have sex, the better, because it gives you confidence. And sexually confident women, women who think they're good in bed, so increase your skills as well. If you're worried that you're not a great lover, read up on it, buy some of the books, go online, look up technique, you know, because technique is very important. And the better lover you think you are, the less you worry about what you look like in bed. We all know that sexually confident women win all the time. And sexually confident women put on weight the same way other people do as they get on in life, et cetera, et cetera. You know, their bodies are different after pregnancy, but they don't focus on that. They're like, hey, I'm a brilliant lover. Who cares? You know, he's not looking at that. He's just thinking how fantastic I am. Focus on becomes our reality. So if you can start to focus on things that make you feel good, and I have a lot of also exercises in the book about how to do this, like really like mirroring exercises where you're looking at your body in the mirror and you're looking at the things that you actually do like and appreciate about your body. I mean, mm. you have to get comfortable with your own body naked because if you're not comfortable with yourself naked, how are you going to feel comfortable naked with anybody else? This body hate thing, body disgust, I mean, it's just, it doesn't, it does not work with sex, okay? And also, like it's, um, and even if getting people, I'm not saying you have to love your body, but what I try to get people to is a body neutrality. At least you're neutral. If you're just neutral, you're like, I accept my body. It's just, it's gonna help you so much in the bedroom, feel connected to your sexuality. Because then you realize like, we all just have these bodies and really like so much of sex is your is your brain and your body connection. And so if you can start just thinking thoughts that are gonna make you feel feel better about it and removing things like negative accounts or people that make you feel bad, then that's, this is really gonna help yeah. you. And people who deprive themselves or you <clears throat> see bodies that you think are, you know, a lot of people who are, who are depriving or not eating or maybe they're really like thin or whatever you are aspirational. I see people who are depriving themselves like deprivation does not lead to desire. And improving your physical health is less about your body image and more about like your, your physical health does have an impact on your sexual health. Hello? Like it's blood flow. It's And of course, it's the way that you feel about your body image. But it's it's so much more than that. Like if you aren't eating healthy, if you're not sleeping right, if you're overstressed, if you're over-exercising, if you're obsessed about your body, if you're overweight, like all of these things have an impact on the way your body functions. So what do you need to do about it? Do something about it. You know, I, I don't know if it's possible for you to be attracted to someone else if you're not first attracted to yourself. I really believe that to be true. I know that there's been times when I haven't been real happy with my body, you know, whether it was postpartum or just a time when I was like, you know, my body was trying to like figure out what weight I was supposed to be. And I was gaining weight after, you know, depleting my calories and killing my metabolism. And I started like gaining weight and like looking in the mirror and like not loving my body. And I remember not feeling as much desire toward my partner, which is crazy because his body hadn't changed. His body still looked amazing, but I wasn't as in the mood because I think, I don't know if this is true, but I feel like women, we kind of have to be like, I don't want to say turned on by ourselves, but like we at least have to find ourselves desirable, right? So if nothing else, maybe that's the motivation you need to make some changes to your, to your nutrition, to your overall health, to figuring out like how you can feel your best about you. Like, listen, we're never going to be 20 years old again. I'm not trying to be 20 years old again, but I do know that I've never felt better about my body and the way that I look and the way that 
things have come together for my husband and I sexually. And I think a big piece of this is like age, right? Like that's the way that God is really fair because when you're younger, all you do, so those of you who are younger and worried about getting older, don't worry about it. Please don't worry about it. Just keep doing the right things because as you get older, you start caring less and less and less what other people think and your confidence starts going up. And as your confidence increases, your desires and your openness and your level of comfort with yourself increases. And all of that makes for a better sex life. Again, I'm not the expert on all this. I just like to share like what's worked for us without too many specific details. But it's been really, 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 really good. And when I had that like rude Facebook comment where people were saying like, you're obsessed with this. I'm like, I'm going to double down because this is really important. And I know if something can improve my life, I know I'm meant to share it with you and encourage you to improve your life. Don't accept mediocrity. Is it mediocrity or mediocrity? Mediocrity. Yeah, whatever. Don't accept average. Don't accept anything less than what you believe is delicious and yummy and fulfilling and everything you dreamed of. Do the work though. It takes work and you can do it. We start today. Got a lot of resources for you below in the show description. I love you. I mean it. And I'll talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.